So today we're going to be talking about Ionic moving to web components. We're super excited to be here, uh, especially kind of a late addition. So uh, if you don't know what Ionic is, we'll talk about that first. But before we do that, a little quick intro about ourselves. Uh, I am Max Lynch. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ionic. I'm also one of the co-creators of Ionic Framework, the open source project. And I'm Adam Bradley, uh, lead developer of Ionic and also a co-creator of Ionic. So uh, really quickly, uh, if you're not familiar with Ionic, Ionic is basically a cross-platform UI component kit, uh, initially kind of focused on building native-style apps for the App Store. So people used to call this, uh, they still do call it sometimes, like Bootstrap for mobile. Um, and if it's helpful to think, think about it like that, that's, that's really what it is. Uh, it's open source, MIT licensed, cross-platform UI kit. So uh, you can build iOS and Android apps. That's really kind of our bread and butter. Uh, you can build universal Windows uh, platform apps. Uh, but increasingly, uh, people are building progressive web apps, responsive web apps, and Electron apps, all with the same code base. Uh, so the right ones run anywhere thing that's always been kind of elusive and people still laugh at, a lot of our developers are actually doing that today because it's just based on the web, and the web runs pretty much everywhere. Uh, so we're 100% based on web technology, HTML5, JavaScript, CSS. Uh, and if, if, uh, if you're used to building mobile apps, one thing people really like about a web approach is it's just really easy to customize. Uh, CSS and HTML is one of the easiest things to style. Um, and so we're proud that we're based 100% on web technology. Uh, Ionic's one of the top open source projects on GitHub. And we've had millions of apps created. Some you might use, like Dow Jones Market Watch and Untapped, which is a social network for people who like to drink beer. Uh, and then one thing we're seeing a lot more of that I'm really, really excited about, uh, these big uh, enterprise companies are starting to build a lot of apps internally. Uh, and Ionic is, is powering a lot of these. So we're really, really excited about that. They're starting to do their own mobile development. Um, and it's, it's really great. Uh, finally, it's a real business behind Ionic. Um, we build services and tools for app development. If you want to learn more about that, check us out at ionicframework.com. So real quick, we want to go over a brief history of kind of how we got here today and why Ionic and the decisions that we made, why it is the way it is. So this was our original goal. It goes way back to when we first started that we really kind of wanted to focus on letting developers focus on building their applications and not so much the, the details. So in this case, we want to be able to enable developers to just add a toggle, not worry about how does a toggle work, how to add gestures, what happens when it gets all the way to uh, 50 pixels to the right or left. Rather, we just want the developer to worry about, I want to add a toggle there because I'm focused on my own app. So if you look back, we started this in 2013. And Alex had a great talk earlier kind of talking about the details of how difficult this was to do. And I will, I'll freely admit that in 2013, I had never heard of a thing called Web Component. But what we were at was we were largely using jQuery. Um, and jQuery kind of was great, but it also had required a lot of um, kind of manual setup and things like that. And, and Alex's talk did a really great job of showing that. So it really wasn't the ideal solution. So then we came across Angular and Angular directives. And, and personally, I was blown away by it kind of was exactly what we were looking for. So with Angular directives, we were able to make components um, and provide a large UI library to all of our users so that they could have this cool UI library, pick and choose which components they want to use, and build large applications with it. But again, meeting our first goal of letting developers build large applications. And so we fell in love with AngularJS from the start. But then also, if you look at our very first commits, um, we had a bindings directory. And in that bindings directory, we had AngularJS, um, Backbone, Ember, and jQuery, and a few others were in there. So we were kind of naive and, and kind of ambitious to think that, well, we'll just make a binding for all of them, because it's got to be that easy, right? Within a week, we quickly realized that's not going to happen. Um, so we decided to stick with uh, AngularJS, but it was kind of an eye-opening for us of like, how difficult it is to build components for just one framework, let alone many of them. And even if you were to fast forward today, we would have had to build even another 50 more components or 50 more things to the frameworks. So fast forward to today, I still love Angular. Um, I'm personally a huge fan of it. I have nothing but the utmost respect for the core team and what they've brought to the web development community. But the reality is, is that Angular is not the only awesome framework right now. Um, and then we've moved from which is the best framework conversation to now which framework do you prefer? Because they're all actually, in, in reality, they're all great. So it kind of comes down to the team that's using it or the developer of their choice of which framework they want to use. So I think you can see where I'm going with this is that as web components emerged, um, as we realized um, it's actually a viable solution, we started to question it. It's like, maybe this is trying to meet our original goal of, maybe of what we wanted to do, of kind of writing one component and having it work everywhere. So this is what we're here to talk about today. 
So uh, that was kind of our journey to, di to discovering web components and actually uh, considering them a viable option. But at the same time, around this time, uh, progressive web apps really emerged on the scene. And considering Ionic's goal was really write once, run anywhere, um, kind of a UI framework for, all of, for building apps on all platforms, it was obvious that we were going to jump right in and embrace progressive web apps. Um, and our early experiments were actually really, really disheartening for our team. Uh, we initially were, and, and still to this day, like we, we, we focus on Cordova apps uh, in the App Store. And, and on, a Cor on a Cordova app, all your code is bundled next to your app in the same local domain. So there's no network latency. There's no 3G to worry about. And when we took that approach of building with a framework like Angular and bundling all our components together, uh, we were seeing really, really bad results uh, when it came to going to progressive web apps. We're talking like 73 scores on Lighthouse, on 3G emerging market test, 13 seconds time to interactive. Uh, it's just not even usable. Um, and we were shipping like over a megabyte of code for the first view. Uh, and, and, and the worst part about this, uh, that Alex has, has mentioned a lot, and it's totally true, we couldn't solve it. We hit an engineering wall. Our current our approach of, of bundling all these components up and then trying to pull them apart and do code splitting uh, once everything was already bundled together was just not working. We spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of effort, and frankly, spent a lot of money trying to figure it out, and we couldn't. Um, and so we kind of... Uh, took a step back, and at the same time, uh, we, we had bet the, the farm on Angular, and what had happened in the front end space is that frameworks really pro proliferated. Uh, Angular had a lot of usage, but so did React, and so did Vue, and so did Ember. You know, I'm sure if you asked individual developers of these frameworks, they would pretend like it's the only game in town. But if you look at the data, it's not at all true. Uh, and so Ionic was looking at this fragmentation happening and saying, well, we're having issues with framework performance in general, but if we want to support these other frameworks, now we have to go and build bindings for each uh, individual framework. It just wasn't really going to happen, and so we, we felt like we were kind of stuck. Uh, but then we, we started experimenting with web components. Uh, we started taking our Angular components and pulling them out and porting them to vanilla web components, and it was actually really, really promising. And it, it actually ported over really well from Angular 2, and I give the Angular API a lot of credit for, for uh, kind of being similar to web components. And our first results were really, really encouraging. Our 3G time to interactives were four to six times faster, 2.78 seconds compared to 11 and 13 seconds before. Uh, we were shipping 10 times less code, uh, especially for the first view. We're talking 39 kilobytes compared to 422. Like, that's a, that's a really big difference. And that was a highly optimized Angular Ionic 2 app. Uh, and then we, we, we had a build step because we used TypeScript, and it was considerably faster. We're talking like 3.87 seconds for production builds compared to 50 seconds. So not only was it faster loading uh, components, but the developer experience was better. Uh, but we still felt like something was missing from these vanilla web components. We really, really love traditional frameworks, and we think they've given developers some really great tools. Things like reactive data binding, virtual DOM, uh, support and, and kind of embrace of TypeScript. Um, and also some key innovations that we saw, like React Fiber, where the, the approach for performance, performance was moving from you know, how quickly can I synchronously render 10,000 items to how can I help the browser not lock up its UI thread and do less work. And we felt like those were key innovations that web components really needed to stay competitive. Uh, and finally, we, we wanted to use JSX. Uh, we're excited about some of the template literal stuff as well. Um, and we, ha we knew that server-side rendering pre-compilation had to work out of the box. Uh, so we took uh, our great promising results from, from going to vanilla web components with the desire to bring these framework features that we really, really loved and missed and decided to see if we could combine them together. Uh, and so today, we're really, really excited to announce a new project that we've been working on that's really an artifact from our own efforts uh, that helps developers build faster web components with framework features that they desire, but in a 100% standards compliant way. Uh, so today, we're announcing a new project we're calling Stencil. And Stencil is a compiler for web components that Adam will talk about in a bit. Uh, it's still super alpha, but we are using it for a lot of stuff internally. Uh, so, so we created it for ourselves. We're using it for ourselves. It's going to power the next version of Ionic. Uh, so we're really excited about it. But keep in mind, it's still alpha. Uh, and we'll have links at the end. So, and, and this is really Adam's brainchild, so I should let him talk about it. Yeah, thanks, Max. <laughs> So Stencil is, is largely a compiler for web components. Um, and so what it builds is 
optimize custom elements. So the big thing I want to get across is that this is not yet another framework. It's not a stencil framework. It's not window.stencil that adds a bunch of stuff and a stencil API. Rather, it's, um, it's using the build time compiler to build just vanilla custom elements that work in all browsers. And that was key that we really wanted to focus on. And so with that compiler, we're also able to enable virtual DOM, server-side rendering, um, pre-compilation, asynchronous rendering, and reactive data binding. And it's absolutely been inspired by the best parts of Angular, React, Vue, and Polymer. Um, and again, as Max was saying, it's based on TypeScript because, honestly, we use TypeScript because we, it's made us really um, productive in, in building applications and building Ionic itself. So we use TypeScript because we enjoy it. The side effect is that everyone else gets the typed library that we have. But the real reason is because we prefer it. Um, and we also use JSX along with that also. And I'd also like to add that it is MIT licensed. So with our goal of creating just vanilla um, custom elements, we really want to make sure that we had no external dependencies of any library to include Stencil. Stencil is not a framework, um, but rather it's just the compiler for it. And so by reducing or removing all, every single external dependency and having just a vanilla custom element, we're able to then work in all frameworks, which is kind of our original goal. So if you go back to what we originally wanted to do in 2013 was just make it easy for developers to build applications. Fast forward to today, there's many ways to do it in many different frameworks. So we feel like this is kind of meeting our original goal, and we're really proud of that. And on top of that, Stencil can be used to create just standalone components, or it could be used to create um, entire applications. And it's been working great with all framework, with one um, caveat that we've had issues with um, React, and that React hasn't been working the best with web components. And so that's an area that we would love to work with the React community and, and improving upon moving forward. So the way I like to think about Stencil um, is that it's kind of a pre, it, it pre-bakes custom elements, uh, pre-compiles, whatever. It takes a lot of these concepts that we've really ex expect and have gotten to like about frameworks like virtual DOM, lazy loading, change detection, all that stuff. Uh, and, and there's a simple compiler that just takes those concepts and builds custom elements with some of that stuff baked in. Uh, so we call it Stencil because it's just a tool to help you stamp out these components. It gets out of the way at runtime. All right, so we talked a lot about asynchronous rendering, um, JSX, and all that above. So we kind of wanted to show off something here. So a few months ago at a React conference, they had an amazing demo where they showed this. This is React version 15. And what's going, what's going on here is that there is the single node at the very top that's being updated with a new number every single second. And then that passes all the information down to all its child um, elements and so on and so forth. And then every single frame, each one of those circles is being animated out. And every single one of these circles has a mouse over and mouse out um, event on it. As you can see, this is um, React 15 is no joke. But this is a very difficult, difficult app to pull off because you've got over 700 nodes being updated every single second. So what's happening here is why you see it kind of jank a little bit is because the browser is kind of freezing, trying to get sure that all those 700 nodes are updated. So this is why it's kind of janking like that. And so if you've heard, React Fiber is kind of solving this problem. So React Fiber is, in, um, is the next version of React. It's in beta right now. Um, and we read all about it. And, and we were really intrigued by how they're solving this, where instead of trying to synchronously update every single node, it lets it, it, lets it kind of put into an asynchronous queue which then lets the browser kind of manage that. So we were curious, like, all right, that sounds awesome, React. I wonder if we can do that, because frankly, we also have asynchronous rendering. Can we do that with Stencil? And so we're really thrilled to show, like, we were blown away by the first refresh to see that actually this thing is pretty darn smooth. It's updating just as many elements. It's the same thing. All the properties are being passed down. Um, and so it's kind of proving that this tiny little web component that we have here, which is just vanilla, not dependent on anything else, is just as performant as React 15 in the next version, or React 16 in the next version. So we're really proud of kind of the performance that we've gotten from this. So back to the slides. Yeah, so that's a quick kind of demo of some of the performance with the asynchronous rendering engine. Uh, but we've kind of talked a lot and, and haven't really gotten any code, which is the best part, right? Uh, so uh, I want to talk through kind of what a simple stencil component looks like. And the, the cool thing about Stencil is this is pretty much the entire API. It's very small. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of uh, surface area to the API. It's, if you know ES6, if you know TypeScript, it's pretty easy to understand. So this is an example of a Stencil component. It's a simple ES6 TypeScript class. We are using decorators to indicate that this is a component. 
we specify the tag name, and then we can also link a style sheet. So we support SAS or vanilla CSS out of the box. Uh, inside the actual class itself, you'll notice this at prop decorator. And what this does is basically indicate that this class member is going to be filled in from a property on the actual component. Um, so someone above this component would actually write name equals blah or age equals blah. Uh, we have typing information, so we kind of know what the type is going to be. Stencil is based on TypeScript, and we, we do use this type information to our benefit. Um, and then inside the render function, you've noticed this a few times today. This is kind of where th we feel things are moving. Uh, we, we, we compute the next uh, view, basically, uh, using JSX. But in theory, we could use template literals or, or anything in here. Uh, and we're, we're taking the value of this.name and this.age. Uh, the cool thing here is if, if name or age changes, the component knows how to redraw itself automatically. There's also another thing instead of prop, there's state for internal state. Uh, it's a very explicit way to indicate that this, this member variable is going to change. And if it changes, we need to redraw ourselves. So this is what a component is. And, you, and, and underneath the hood, we generate a simple custom element uh, using this code. Uh, so there's really not a lot of surface area. If you know this little API, you know how to use Stencil. So and also, because we're, everything is broken apart and asynchronous, um, one thing we wanted to make sure we, we pulled off from the very beginning is that all the components are lazy loaded. So a challenge that we've had with um, our existing versions of Ionic is that if you wanted to use a checkbox, you needed to use everything. And that worked well in Cordova world, but um, moving forward, it's really not working well in, in PWA. So we wanted to make sure that if you only use Toggle, it was going to be the only stuff you downloaded. So out of the box, we made sure that we enabled this, but also wanted to meet our goal of not having external dependencies. So Webpack was our challenge to say, like, could we do this without Webpack? Because that kind of seems the, the standard right now. And sure enough, the way we're doing it is that we're able to just register just kind of the base information about a component. So we tell the browser, like, hey, these are all the components that are possible, but that's really about it. We don't go further into detail, or we don't have any more code than saying, like, ion toggle is a thing, ion checkbox is a thing. And then, hey, browser, if you happen to see that, let me know. And that's about all that we register up front. And so then from there, what we're kind of doing is we're reversing how uh, traditional lazy loading works, where traditionally a developer on their computer will run the build step, and we take these best guesses of which things should be bundled together and which pages should be bundled together and which stuff do we think the user is going to request. Um, and then we ship that as, as one big final package. But with this, we're letting the browser decide exactly what it needs. We don't even get involved. We just say, hey, browser, let me know when this thing happens. And when you need Ion checkbox, then we'll send it to you at that time. And so then users are only downloading what they need. And another awesome benefit of this is because we have a compiler, we can hash all the file names of these files. And so with that, we can then forever cache all of these files. And so on your phone and CDNs and um, edge networks, all these files can be cached. So if you have the slightest update to your app, let's say you had a misspelling and you want to update the app, you don't need to rebuild the entire application and reship it to all your millions of users for them to download the, the large bundle anymore. Now you can just say, I have this one file update. Let's update that file. And um, users are only updating, the, uh, updating the, the changed file, and everything else is still um, static on their phone, or as fast as it can possibly be. So we're really proud of, of this being able to enable this with kind of how we're using a compiler to pull that off. And on top of that, we want to make sure that all of this stuff was easy to share. So with large organizations um, and any company, really, or any organization, it's, it's often a challenge of which framework. Um, different teams have different frameworks. So different developers use different frameworks. And so this has been talked a lot about a lot during this conference. And so we want to make sure that it was just as possible for people to put together a collection of their components that they can then easily share with all the teams in their company. And we want to do this also through NPM, which, which is awesome to hear that Polymer is doing the same thing, too. But another challenge that we've had has been with sharing our SVGs of like our Ionicons. So Ionicons is a project of ours where we have over 900 SVG icons which people can choose from. Again, that has the problem of like, well, I don't want to download 900 icons for this to work. So we were able to solve that with kind of the same concepts here. But at the same time, it's easy for a developer to build this and have their 900 icons in their application. But as a UI library that wants to share these 900 files, it becomes a challenge. Because now it's in node modules, which needs to get copied to the correct folder in your application. And then at the same time, it needs to get requested from the same location from the browser. So there's kind of two steps there. That's always been a challenge that we've had a lot of workarounds. But with Stencil, we make sure that this was seamless, where you just import or you just require um, which 
or you require the, the collection of ionic, ionicons, and it's all handled for you, so you don't have to worry about that. And additionally, we also are able to group certain components together, because in reality, there are certain components that will come together. For example, we have ion card. Ion card has ion header and ion content inside of it. So chances are, if you use ion card, you're going to use those other two also. So we want to make sure that we can reduce as many requests as possible, or separate requests as possible, so we're able to easily bundle them together. And again, the biggest thing I want to get across from this is that the final output is not a stencil thing. It is purely vanilla custom elements. And Ionic Core is really just another collection. So again, it can be reused in any, um, any framework to include Ionic Angular. So, and that's another thing I want to make sure that, that I get across is that the next versions of Ionic Angular will continue to work the exact same. Everything you're using about Ionic Angular is just like how version 3 works, except now under the hood, we're using this to pull it off. And then we have the added benefits as the developers that we can then enable it for React developers and Vue developers and so on, and whatever comes out next month. Additionally, we want to make sure that server-side rendering was enabled. Um, um, traditionally, that's been kind of difficult to do with web components. But we, because we're using our own um, asynchronous rendering engine, we were actually somewhat easily, we were easily able to add this to um, our components. So what that means is your first paint can be just HTML and CSS. So that perception is lightning fast and as fast as it could possibly be, because you're only rendering the bare minimum of what that first paint has to be. But then on top of that, another thing that keeps coming up is TTI, time to interactive. That was our core focus, to make sure that the actual time to, time to interactive was really just as fast as it possibly could be. So what we're doing is making sure that all of the existing nodes that came back in that first request for that first paint are the same ones that we just enhanced with listeners. Um, so we're not repainting the whole thing like you see in other frameworks. And also, just like how we want to make sure that you develop on desktop and you develop on mobile, you kind of have a single experience of what you're creating, we feel it's the same thing of like if you're developing for client side, a browser, or you're developing on the server. So we want to make sure that the experience of developing stencil components is the same whether you're doing server-side rendering, pre-rendering, or it's for the browser. So to do that, we're able to have window and document and everything that you're used to, so you don't have to kind of change your mind or do a mind shift of like between the different versions. So just some, some FAQs here. Uh, who is Stencil for? Well, first and foremost, it's for us. Uh, we built it because we needed faster apps. Like, like we mentioned, we wanted to be, and we do want to be, a major UI uh, framework and solution for progressive web apps. And frankly, we, we just were kind of dead in the water without uh, coming up with a different approach. So we need faster apps with, with components that run in all frameworks, because we can't possibly support all the frameworks out there with our components uh, and the ones that, that will come out in the future. Uh, secondly, it's, avail it's, it's meant for UI framework authors. I strongly believe that the days of building a CSS jQuery framework, like, like let's say, a Bootstrap, or even like an Ionic that has its own CSS, and then trying to build custom bindings for every framework, I feel like those days are coming to an end. I think it's a, it's a really positive thing for both UI framework authors, because they, they can do less work, but also users. I think we've all used a like bootstrap binding that had uh, one set of features for one framework and had different features for another. Um, and so web components kind of solve that problem for us. And Stencil can help these developers build these components. Uh, for large development teams that are using a lot of different frameworks and build chains, uh, using Stencil and using web components, they can share components, like branded, like your team has a branded button or a specific thing that has to be in every single app. Instead of duplicating that every time, you can just share the components with everyone. Uh, and then finally, for app developers, we all want faster mobile and desktop apps, right? So uh, this can help us get it. Um, so how is this different from current solutions? Uh, I think the biggest difference is that it's a compiler, not a, not a runtime solution. So we do all the work during the build step. It's just a simple NPM install. There's no CLI. It's just a, a NPM script for your app. Uh, and this just generates a set of optimized custom elements. Uh, so there's nothing stencil in the final output. We keep saying that, but I just want to really like, drive it home. There's no window.stencil. It doesn't exist. It's just your components. Uh, and this complements all frameworks, because we, we really like, don't want to discourage anyone from using React or Vue. If you like it, that's great. We, we kind of have taken a step back and saying, we don't really care what you want to use anymore. We're done fighting that battle. Uh, we're just going to create uh, custom elements. You can use them if you want. But if you want to explore this brave new world where you don't use a traditional framework, you just use web components, we support that too. And we're actually really, really excited about that. Uh, hashtag use the platform. Uh, <laughs> 
And it's a small footprint. There's very little view uh, code here. There's no CLI. Uh, and then finally, this is you know, going back to kind of preferences. We've built this on TypeScript. TypeScript has let us get a lot of rich typing metadata that we actually use for the tool. Um, but as a, as a company, we've really embraced TypeScript. We feel like enterprise usage is really, really accelerating on TypeScript. So uh, we base it on TypeScript. We're, we love it. Uh, but if you don't, then maybe this is a point of uh, disagreement. <laughs> Uh, so what's next with Stencil? Our Stencil-created components are going to go live in you know, hundreds of thousands, hopefully, of Ionic apps. Uh, who knows? This might be the biggest distribution of web components in the app stores uh, in short order. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we're going to begin seeking some feedback on an experimental Ionic with Stencil starter instead of just Ionic with Angular or a typical framework. And based on the feedback, we might integrate that more deeply into our tooling. So this is still experimental. We're not really sure how people will like it. Uh, we need better state management, a la something like Redux. So we're working on something like that. Uh, trying to make it easy to import third-party modules, uh, looking at maybe template literal templates like lit.html beyond JSX. Because we're just a compiler, it's pretty easy to swap that out. But we've just decided to go with JSX today. Uh, and then we're going to submit our HN PWA, which we're really excited about. Yeah, so we're really, you know, again, this is something we built for ourselves. But we're really proud, you know, to show this off and, you know, get some feedback of what you guys would think or what the, the the community thinks. And so we have it up on our GitHub, and we have a couple demos out there. They include the Fiber demo and the Hack News demo. So I've labeled enough. We've labeled enough about this. But one thing I want to say is like, take a look for yourself. So take a look at this Hack News app um, and do the traces yourself. Look at the file sizes. Look at how fast the time to interactive is. And just take a look. And you'll see that it rivals the best PWAs out there right now. And so we're really, really proud of it. And on top of that, um, it's built from a component of libraries. It's not just uh, a bunch of divs that have you know, different background colors and stuff and, and just switching out divs. This is an actual legitimate large-scale application that has modals and alerts, popovers, all the different things that you want in an application. But it also loads just as fast as any other of the fastest PWAs right now. So please, we encourage you to take a look. Um, and we're really proud of what we have so far. Thank you very much. Thank you.